we, uh, we spent a large chunk of time, and uh, Marx has spent many pages uh, reflecting on the nature of surplus value and the two kinds of surplus value absolute, which arises from extending the length of the working day, and relative, which arises out of increases in productivity, which are given either by organizational transformations in cooperation, division of labor, or by the hardware in the form of machinery and the factory system and the like. As is typical with Marx when he does a grand bifurcation of this kind, you know, from saying, well, the surplus value, we've got to look at the two forms, he then wants to put them back together again, and because in the end there's only one form of surplus value. And so he is going to insist that you couldn't have absolute unless there was a technical basis for it, uh, and an adequate organizational form for it. You couldn't have relative unless there was absolute. So clearly uh, they are interdependent, and in a sense uh, we have to consider them as unified in the creation of surplus value. But he insists on keeping the distinction because this helps us understand something about capitalist strategies as they're searching for surplus value. That is, uh, their strategy can emphasize the absolute or it can emphasize the relative, and so that uh, in terms of strategic uh, possibilities for the capitalist in search of surplus value, we have to always bear in mind uh, this dual character of the way in which surplus value can be gained. Uh, as usual with Marx, he does a couple of things in this uh, chapter which uh, are sort of summary points, but actually both of the summary points he produces in this chapter have been the center of a great deal of controversy, and therefore I think uh, we should explain a little bit what those controversies are and how those controversies have arisen. To begin with, he has several times in preceding chapters introduced the idea of the collective laborer, so that the extraction of surplus value is no longer a sort of an individual thing that goes on between a particular individual laborer and the capitalist is now seen as part of a collective uh, aspect. And the difficulty with this is it raises the question as where does the collective laborer begin and where does the collective laborer end? There is a simple sort of version of that which would say, well, if you, if you see a factory, you would say the collective labor is all of that that's inside of the factory, which would include the people making the stuff, uh, the people who are pushing the, you know, the, the uh, loads of cloth around, or, or, or people who are cleaning the floors, and all those kinds of things. So you could come up with a sense of saying, well, everybody who's employed in the factory is the collective laborer. Some of those people in the factory will not be doing uh, the actual work of production, they will be ancillary to it in some way or other. But you can see immediately then issues arise when you kind of say things like, well, what do you do with subcontractors who are subcontracting parts into the factory? Are they part of the collective labor or are they not? And what about the subcontractors to the subcontractors? Uh, what do we do about uh, the outsourcing of, say, uh, mental aspects uh, in design and engineering uh, forms and so on? So actually there's a lot of controversy over exactly what is meant by collective labor and how to configure the idea of collective labor, because where you, if you decide to sort of say it's just inside the factory, then you get one definition. If you start to sort of proliferate it and say, well, you pretty much can end up with almost everybody who's employed in a capitalist society, including you know, people employed in banks and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of controversy over what he means by collective labor, but nevertheless this doesn't invalidate his point which I think is a very important one, which is that you can only go so far in examining this dynamic of extraction of surplus value by using this figure of the individual laborer and their capacity to labor, uh, contracting their labor power to the capitalist. You can only go so far with that, you now have to move 
to a somewhat different perspective, and as we'll see in the subsequent chapters, he's much more interested in moving from what you might call the micro perspective of the individual labourer to the whole field of class relations. And as you make that move from the individual labourer to class relations, you could argue that the notion of the collective labourer is a kind of a way of, uh, of, of, of accomplishing that part of that transition. The second thing he does is to kind of say, well, the notion of the collective labourer broadens our idea of what we're talking about, but when we reflect back on what we've done, we also have to narrow it to the idea that productive labour is productive labour only insofar as it produces or, or contributes to the production of surplus value. Now this also has been the object of very considerable discussion. In part, it's kind of an emotive thing, because nobody likes to be called unproductive. So if you say to somebody, you are in the unproductive labourer cat, you know, people kind of get, you know, kind of irritated, and they don't like that, so they kind of say, well, no. Marx tries to mollify that point by saying, but actually under capitalism to be a productive labourer is a misfortune. So not to be a productive labourer is something you should be really looking for, i.e. not to produce surplus value for the capitalist. Again, I think his point is very valid, which is the definition of productivity under capitalism is the capacity to produce surplus value. This is not a normative statement. It's not a normative statement in the sense that says, well, that's true for all times and all modes of production. In fact, you could argue that a revolutionary movement would try to do away with that particular definition of productivity and that what it would seek for is another definition of productivity, which is social worth or something of that kind. Marx is kind of saying, you take this wide, de this wide possibility of, of productive labour, and what capitalism does is to narrow it down to the point where if you don't produce surplus value for the capitalist, you are deemed not to be productive. So it is something which is defined by capital. But then here too the question is, well, who contributes to the production of surplus value? And this will take us back to some of the debates which uh, were very strong in the early 1970s between socialist feminists and, 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 and some Marxists kind of saying, well, actually you have to see the domestic sphere as being productive in the sense that it actually uh, reduces the cost of reproduction of labour power, and by so doing actually allows a lower wage to be paid, and therefore it's productive within the whole system. So again, I want to signal to you, I'm not going to give you any kind of answers to these debates, but I want to signal to you that both the concept of the collective labourer and the productive labourer are controversial uh, historically, and need a great deal of nuancing if you want uh, to push the theory into uh, practical uh, realms of ap application. There is also one other point to be noticed here, and that is there is a connectivity between Marx's def definition of collectivity and the definition of productive labour. In a sense, you could argue that the definition of the collective labourer from the standpoint of a class definition, is going to be uh, constituted by all of those people who contribute to, directly or indirectly, the production of surplus value which is going to be appropriated by the capitalist. So you shouldn't necessarily see these two concepts as isolated from each other, they interact, intersect with each other and create uh, a way in which we can start to think about uh, the class relation which exists between capital and labour in terms of what happens to the surplus value at the class level. So I see these two concepts as Marx trying to, you know, rather typically come out of this definition of absolute and relative surplus value, say there's a, there's a obviously only one form of surplus value with two strategies, but within that we also start to see these redefinitions occurring about what is productive, what is collective, and that acts as a sort of a stepping stone, a typical kind of fashion from the figure of the individual labourer to the notion of, 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 class, of class relations, which is going to be picked up on 
uh, later. Now the next two chapters are, are sort of slightly uh, which, which deal with uh, the way in which the uh, price of labor and changes of magnitude in the price of labor get set again form a transition to the discussion of, of wages. So in chapter 17, for example, he wants to point out that actually the mix of ways by which capitalists can procure surplus value from the relative standpoint, this mix of ways is rather interesting. And of course he slips through and you know you get the point when you read the heading, the length of the working day and the intensity of labor constant, the productivity of labor variable. Then we go on to the length of the working day and the productivity of labor constant, the intensity of labor variable. The productivity of and intensity of labor constant, the length of working day variable, and then the final section, simultaneous variations in the duration, productivity and intensity of labor. Now, all of this is in a sense a little bit self-evident that he's got three variables, if you like, and they contribute to uh, the production of surplus value in differing degrees. Again, these are different strategic devices which the capitalists have. I think the point to notice here, which is a point which we're going to emphasize, and I've already emphasized it to some degree, is that Marx rarely takes any issue of this kind as if somehow or other there's a fixed outcome. That actually there are different ways that capitalists can move. And one of the themes I think which some people find surprising about capital is the degree to which Marx is emphasizing the flexibility of capital in relationship to the dynamics of the situation they are in. And many of the kind of external views of Marx are, well, he was always talking about, he's, he's a structuralist, he's talking about fixed structures, everything's fixed, you know. Well, well you see what he's doing here is he's saying, okay, I can, I can unpack these different strategic possibilities, but how they work together in a particular situation, I can't predict. And typically what happens, if capitalists get blocked in one direction, they go in the other. If they can't do it by intensity, they do it by lengthening the working day. If they can't do it by lengthening the working day, they do it by intensity. And if they can't do it by either of those, what do they do? Raise productivity. So they have flexible strategies. And this emphasis upon the flexibility seems to me to be one of the elements you could take from this, this chapter, uh, even though I think the sort of way sets it up that, you know, three variables, this and this, you hold these two constants, and this one, you know, is, is, is fairly self-evident. But, but the flexibility that's implied in this, in terms of the dynamics of capitalism, is, uh, is important. And then the chapter after that, he, I think, got nervous about the idea that people would forget exactly how you define surplus value, so he, he gives you a reprise of that. Um, this goes on several times, by the way, in, in, in Capital, and, and I, I think that probably what was going on was he was getting very, I mean this was, in his view, the great innovation of Capital. And for those of us who've kind of seeped it up over the years, and, and, and even those people who have not even understood it directly, uh, some of that seems, okay, all right, well we know that, we, we, we know what surplus value is, and, and, and so there's no issue about this, but Marx, I think, felt he really had to keep on coming back to it uh, in order to make sure we really understood it. And uh, it's still today the case that people don't always get to the end of capital with having understood it, so sometimes it's a good idea that he does this. And it's a good idea for you, if you feel uncertain in any way, to read these passages very carefully where he does this and kind of say, well, have I really got it? Do I really know what's going on here? Uh, and in, for instance, in these sections, he, this great emphasis is, of course, on the difference between what labor gets as a commodity and what labor produces in the way of value. So this difference between what labor produces 
and what labor gets for selling its labor power as a commodity. That is the key difference which is there that the capitalists have to concentrate on all the time in terms of trying to gain, uh, gain their surplus value. Now, the chapters on, chapter on wages, uh, the three chapters on wages, again, I'm not going to deal with these in any great detail. Earlier in, in, in the chapter, in the chapter on the buying and selling of labor power, we dealt with the concept of the value of labor power. And the value of labor power is the value of the commodities which are needed to keep the laborer alive at a given standard of living at a given place in a given time. So we know about the value. On the other hand, wages are a price phenomena. And as Marx says of price, price is the money name of value. But we know that the money name and the money representation is not the same as value. There is as Marx has said several times, a distinction to be made uh, between, there is a, as he says, a quantitative uh, divergence between money and value. There is a qualitative divergence between price and value. So that the quantitative and qualitative divergence, if you go back to the chapter on money, becomes an important issue and it applies as much to the value of labor power when it's converted into a money name called wages. So Marx is interested in what happens through that convergence. And what we see immediately is that this transformation in, in the money name brings us back to part of the argument that he made in the chapter on money where he made this kind of comment, if you remember, that the fact there's a quantitative divergence between the money representation of value and value is an advantage to a system which is based on anarchic market forces. And in particular, if you go back and look at that passage and the commentaries that I was making on that passage, what you'd find me saying was, well, what the price system allows is tremendous fluctuations in demand and supply to go on. And prices go up and prices go down depending upon demand and supply conditions. Value, however, is more, is closer to what Marx there called natural price, i.e. the equilibrium value when demand and supply are in equilibrium. So what does he say in this chapter? This is the place where he gets most explicit about that. This is on page 677 and 78. When he says this, it is not labor which directly confronts the possessor of money on the commodity market, but rather the worker. What the worker is selling is his labor power. As soon as his labor actually begins, it has already ceased to belong to him. It can therefore no longer be sold by him. A very important sentence here, which you should always remember. Labor is the substance and the imminent measure of value, but has no value itself. To say it has value itself would be a tautology. We'd we'll be talking about the value of value. So he then goes on to say, in the expression value of labor, the concept of value is not only completely extinguished, but inverted, so that it becomes its contrary. It is an expression as imaginary as the value of the earth. These imaginary expressions arise, nevertheless, from the relations of production themselves. The expression of value of labor is, of course, an expression that comes from classical political economy. It's not Marxist, so he's critiquing that. He then goes on, classical political economy borrowed the category price of labor from everyday life without further criticism, and then simply asked the question, how is this price determined? Soon recognized that changes in the relation between demand and supply explained nothing with regard to the price of labor or any other commodity except those changes themselves, i.e., the oscillations of the market price above or below a certain mean. If demand and supply balance, the oscillation of prices ceases. 
all other circumstances remaining the same. But then demand and supply also cease to explain anything. The price of labour at the moment when demand and supply are in equilibrium is its natural price, determined independently of the relation of demand and supply. I.e. the natural price is going to be the price of those bundle of commodities which the labourer needs to survive at a given standard of living at a given time. So this explains to you again why it is that Marx does not believe that demand and supply is a crucial explanation of anything other than all of the oscillations that go on in the market. As demand and supply converge on an equilibrium, so you get a natural price, which is the price representation of value, and, uh, and considered in classical political economy and also in Marx's theory as a kind of a reasonable representation of value in the monetary form. So he's going to critique some of these phrases which you find in popular writing about the value of labour and, and so on, and talk about some of the inextricable confusions and contradictions, as he puts it on 679, which confuse us at the same time as they provide a secure base of operations to the vulgar economists uh, with their interest in world of appearance. What then follows is a summary of some of the argument in Capital. Now, chapter 20 and 21 really kind of say, well, once you get into this price form, and again, go back to the chapter on money, and you'll see Marx talking about the price form as not only the money name, but also being able to oscillate and to diverge in all sorts of ways, which of course leads to the way in which prices and price movements mask fundamental relations. And in exactly the same qualitatively, Marx says, as soon as you can hang a price on anything, you can do it on conscience and honour and all these other things which are not commodities. So you can actually partition labour up in different ways and say, well, I'll pay you by the hour, I'll pay you by the minute, I'll pay you by the week, I'll pay you by the month, or I'll pay you by the piece. So capital, has, once it gets into the price domain, has all kinds of choices to make those masks even more explicit. So you hide the extraction of surplus value behind all of these varied wages systems, time wages, peace wages, and Marx writes about the qualities of both. And again, I don't think there's anything particularly difficult about this, and I suspect most of you are fairly familiar with, uh, with, these, with these differences. Uh, but again, clearly, capital has a number of different strategies. It's not only sort of stuck with exploiting the worker just like that, no, it has a system of time wages, different t temporalities involved, it has peace systems and, 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 and hybrid forms and, and, and all the rest of it. So again, Marx is looking at the way the different strategies that capital has in terms of determining what wages are about and how wages are going to be allocated in order, again, to mask. In a sense, it's a deliberate fetishization of the social relation between capital and labour through both the setting up of the price system, which is a necessary fetishism, and then the fet the, even the using the fetishistic constructions, like value of labour and so on, to confuse you ideologically, and at the same time using all of these mechanisms in order to confuse you uh, even further. So what Marx is doing here is to take these issues and sort of lay them on the table so that we see very clearly what a capitalist mode of production is about. In the final section, National Differences in Wages, Marx is harking back to the argument he utilized in chapter 17, where he talked about the different strategies uh, whereby you could produce surplus value. And those different strategies have different impacts upon those commodities which 
fix the value of labor power. And what we have to acknowledge is that those different strategies are likely to vary from one place to another. That in France they may be different from the United States, which is different from Britain. So what Marx is here prepared to concede is that actually out of this, what you would get is even in a situation where there's a, an equal standard of living in terms of material goods between those different places, you would get different value, different values of labor powers because you'd have different prices of those products which determine the value of labor power. In other words, if I go into a strategy of high productivity strategy in order to gain surplus value in the production of shoes, because that's the best way I can go in Britain, then the value of shoes is going to drop. And if, sh and if the value of shoes is important in the value of labor power, then the value of labor power is going to drop even though people have the same command of shoes. If people didn't do that, and you had, uh, say, still an artisanal production of shoes somewhere else, they'd be much higher value, and therefore you'd have to pay labor more, they'd have much higher value. So Marx is really talking about the way in which uneven geographical development can arise out of these different strategies which capitalists have in different situations, different places, and different times. In his instance he's talking about the difference between nation-states, but you could also find regional differences uh, within, say, the United States, or regional differences within France. So these regional differences can start to become important. But again, he doesn't talk about this at great length. He indicates it's, a, it's an issue, and there's a moment there where he also suggests that these differentials in the value of labor power can in fact lead to situations in which value starts to be transferred from one particular political space to another. That is, it's possible to get a hint here of what is called unequal exchange. And the unequal exchange between the nation states can then start to set up ways of extracting surplus value through that unequal exchange. But he doesn't elaborate upon it, he barely hints at it. All he seems to want to do here is to talk about the way in which wage rate determination in different spaces of the world economy are not only going to be confused by the spatial, by the, by the, the, the sort of the temporal uh, and, and the piecework kind of stuff, it's not only going to be confused by that, it's also going to be confused geographically by these differences which can, can arise. Okay, let's go on then to uh, look at the next section, uh, which is part seven. Now part seven, just to set the stage, is I think the, the culminating argument of volume one of Capital. Uh, it's here where he starts to put all of the bits and pieces together and create an understanding of the dynamics of a capitalist mode of production. So we're now going to talk about the capitalist mode of production as a whole. In order to do that we have to move, as I've already suggested, to looking at class relations rather than individuals. And this shift to understanding the capitalist mode of production as a totality is, I think, well, well you, have to, you have to grasp what that, what that shift is about. And the first thing Marx does is in this two-page prologue, he lays out what can best be described as some key assumptions in terms of how he's going to unpack this capitalist mode of production. He starts off by saying, at the bottom of the first paragraph, he's going to be talking now about the circulation of capital in general. And it's accumulation. 
But then he says this, the first condition of accumulation is that the capitalist must have contrived to sell his commodities and to reconvert into capital the greater part of the money received from their sale. In the following pages we shall assume that capital passes through its process of circulation in the normal way. The detailed analysis of the process will be found in volume 2. Now what does this mean? Throughout volume 1 of Capital so far we've been assuming that all commodities are sold at their value. And he's going to assume that in the argument that follows. Now, what does that mean? It means there's always somebody somewhere or other who wants the commodities as use value, and somebody somewhere who has the money to pay for it for them. There is, in effect, no problem in the market. The market is always in equilibrium. There is never any overproduction or underproduction, because everything is being sold at its value, not less than its value or more than its value, at its value, therefore he's going to assume a market equilibrium situation. Put in sort of Keynesian terms, there is no problem of lack of effective demand. Now, is that a reasonable assumption? The answer is not at all. There are a lot of problems in the market. In fact, a lot of crises arise out of lack of effective demand, as Keynes described, and all the rest of it. And we will get into the forms of those crises when we start to do Volume 2 of Capital. But for purposes of Volume 1, he assumes those problems do not exist. Now, this is a classic tactic of modelling anything. You assume something constant. So you can look at something that's variable and varying. And he is going to look at something that's varying, and I think what he looks at is extremely interesting. But that doesn't mean that what he's going to describe in the pages that follows is a full model of a fully operative capitalist mode of production. It's a partial model, and we're going to look at a capitalist mode of production through a certain window, and we're going to describe what we see from that window. And we're going to see a lot of very interesting things, but it's not the only window you can use. In Volume 2 he uses the consumption, realization window, and we see another lot of things. Volume 3, he tries to put those together and says these are in contradiction to each other, therefore the, when you go to the third window, as it were in Volume 3, you see another set of things, because you remember what you saw from Volume 1 perspective and what you saw from Volume 2 perspective, and you then start to get a better idea of the foundational contradictions of a capitalist mode of production. But, from this standpoint, he's going to assume this. The second thing he assumes is in the next paragraph. He says, well, we know in practice that the, the capitalist who produces surplus value is by no means his ultimate proprietor. He has to share it afterwards with capitalists who fill, fulfill other functions in social production taken as a whole, with the owner of land and with yet other people. Surplus value is therefore split up into various parts. Its fragments fall to various categories of person and take on various mutually independent forms such as profit, interest, gains made through trade, ground rent, etc. You could include taxes in the etc. We should be able to deal with these modified forms of surplus value only in Volume 3. There on the next page he explains why you know, this and the first assumption even further. What this means is that he's going to look at the way the system works without any consideration of the way the, the surplus value gets split up between financiers, merchant capitalists, landlords, the state, and all the rest of it. 
And he's going to assume that their activities really play no disturbing role on the capitalism he's going to describe. <coughs> Now again, by the time you get to the end of Volume 3, you realize that actually, particularly something like finance capital, money capital, plays an incredibly important role in the dynamics of what capitalism is about. And if I tried to persuade you that actually Volume 1 is the only proper analysis in today's world where, you know, Citibank is going down the tube and Merrill Lynch is falling apart and the stock market's crashing, you'd say, this is an irrelevant analysis here compared to what is actually going on in capitalist society. But Marx again wants to get a very clear perspective on the dynamics of capitalism from this one window, and he's excluding these complications from his story. He's going to assume there's only one capitalist who extracts surplus value and he's going to look at the relationship between the working class and the capitalist class as if the capitalist class is just a homogeneous entity. Which it's not. And we know it's not. And Marx knows it's not. If you go read something like the 18th Brumaire, you'll find all of these factions, like industrial capital, the financiers, you know, often at loggerheads with each other, are actually sort of doing all kinds of different things. Again, these assumptions are important. Now, there's a third assumption which he doesn't introduce here, but which he introduces on page 727 in a footnote. But I'm going to introduce it here because this is also important. In footnote 2 on page 727, he says this, Here we take no account of the export trade, by means of which a nation can change articles of luxury either into means of production or means of subsistence and vice versa, in order to examine the object error of our investigation in its integrity, free from all disturbing subsidiary circumstances, we must treat the whole world of trade as one nation and assume that capitalist production is established everywhere and has taken possession of every branch of industry. What this in effect says, what this assumption says, is Marx is going to look at capitalism as if it is in a closed system. No colonies, no colonial trade, no export markets, it's a closed system. Now these three assumptions are very strong assumptions. No problems in the market, no issues arise out of the way in which the surplus gets distributed, and we're looking at a closed system. They're very strong assumptions. What you then have to understand is that most of the analysis that follows, not all, but most of the analysis that follows, is contingent upon those assumptions. So if he says, well, this and this and this will happen, well, he means this and this and this will happen in a situation of this sort, where there's no problems in the market and where there are no issues of foreign trade and where the issues of division of the surplus are irrelevant. Now the reason I emphasize this is because People who criticize Marx are very fond of taking certain statements of his and saying, well, this obviously is not true. So obviously the guy is an idiot, not worth reading. And some of their favorite passages that they do this with are the passages which come in the chapters that follow. They take it that Marx is talking about capitalism. He's not. He's talking about capitalism seen from one perspective. And when people say he doesn't, obviously he doesn't understand what capitalism is about because what he said on page 
766 is totally wrong, and they cite it and kind of say, see, don't bother reading Marx, because he's obviously wrong. Well, the answer is, he's not, he's not wrong, it's just that he's making a set of statements which are contingent upon these assumptions. And the full analysis of what a capitalist society is going to look like is going to have to wait till the end of Volume 3 or Volume 4 of Capital. Unfortunately, it never got there. But our task is maybe to get there, if we, if we can, and at the same time to recognize that Volume 1, which is something he did complete for publication, has this quality to it, and not fall into the trap, and actually some pro-Marxists do this, you know, they kind of will t take some statement in here and turn it into a dogma. Marx said, da 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 da, and you say, yeah, I know he said that, but that is a contingent statement. It is not an absolute truth. So, in reading this, please remember all the time that we're dealing with contingent statements, contingent on these assumptions, and that these assumptions are clearly laid out. I mean, I, 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 I always find it odd. Then a lot of readings of Capital, people don't pay any attention to these couple of pages. But they're crucial in setting the stage for what is about to follow. And of course what follows are three chapters, the first of which is about simple reproduction. And Marx imme immediately poses the question, well, how does a society reproduce itself. How does capitalism get reproduced? And again, we first look at this in simplified form by imagining that all of the surplus value which is produced is consumed away, so that all that happens is that capitalism reproduces itself in a stationary state. Now we know that's unlikely for all sorts of reasons, and in the next chapter we see why. But again, we can construct a model, as it were, of simple reproduction. And by simplifying the argument we can see certain critical elements in how a capitalist mode of production really works. So his task here, he says, is to look at this system as a connected whole, and in the constant flux of its incessant renewal. Every social process of production, he says, is the same time a process of reproduction. And so we were interested, therefore, in the capitalist system not only of production but of reproduction. When we start to look at it here from the standpoint of the class perspective, is that what simple reproduction suggests, as he says at the bottom of 712, is a certain positionality of the working class, or the worker. He says what flows back to the worker in the shape of wages is a portion of the product he himself continuously reproduces. The capitalist, is, it is true, pays him the value of the commodity and money, but this money is merely the transmuted form of the product of his labour. So having reproduced labour power, the worker receives money equivalent of what the, what the worker has actually already produced. There is an illusion, says Marx on top 713, which is created by the money form, but this vanish vanishes immediately if, instead of taking a single capitalist and a single worker, we take the whole capitalist class and the whole working class. And comes, I think, a crucial passage. The capitalist class is constantly giving to the working class drafts, in the form of money, on a portion of the product produced by the latter and appropriated by the former. The workers give these drafts back just as constantly to the capitalists and thereby withdraw from the latter their allotted share of their own product. The transaction is veiled by the commodity form of the product, 
and the money form of the commodity. Now what does this describe? Now this describes really the working class is in a kind of company store relation to capital. I, mean, I think that's the best image for it, right? I mean, that's where the worker is. The worker makes the product and then is given money to buy part of their own product back. The result, says Marx, is that variable capital is therefore only a particular historical form of appearance of the fund for providing the means of subsistence. In other words, variable capital is a form of circulation which goes through the body of the worker. But then on 714, Marx makes some interesting gestures, and this is going to come up again. He says, Variable capital, it is true, loses its character of a value advanced out of the capitalist funds only when we view the process of capital production in the flow of its constant renewal. When we thought of it individually, the capitalist had some money, advanced it to buy the labour power. In order to do that, the capitalist had to have an original concentration of money. So Marx here introduces on 714 the idea of primitive accumulation, that the capitalist must have gone out and found some way to get the right amount of money to be able to do this. So there must have been a beginning where the capitalist went out and stole or robbed or did something or other to get, get the money. And that, of course, is going to be the topic of part eight of capital. But then Marx does a very interesting exercise. If a surplus value of 200 pounds, he says, is generated every year by the use of a capital of 1,000 pounds, and if this surplus value is consumed every year, it is clear that when this process has been repeated for five years, the surplus value consumed will amount to 1,000 pounds to the 1,000 pounds originally advanced. And he then goes on, in this kind of vein, to end up at the bottom of 715, long paragraph. He says, When a person consumes the whole of his property by taking upon himself debts equal to the value of that property, it is clear that his property represents nothing but the sum total of his debts. And so it is with the capitalist. When he has consumed the equivalent of his original capital, the value of his present capital represents nothing but the total amount of surplus value appropriated by him without payment not a single atom of the value of his old capital continues to exist. Now what Marx is arguing with here is, of course, John Locke. Because John Locke took the view that private property arises out of the way in which individuals mix their labour with the land. And to the degree that they mix their labour with the land, they have a right to appropriate that land. But who is mixing their labour here with the land and the means of production? The labourer. So what Marx is doing is saying, well, if you took the Lockean theory seriously, the capitalist who started out with £1,000 would lose £200 of it every year because they would consume it away. If they consumed away the surplus, it would be like consuming away two hundred pounds each year of the one original one thousand pounds. At the end of five years, they've consumed away their original wealth. They do not, do not have the right to that wealth anymore. Because they didn't mix their labour with the land, they didn't mix their labour with the means of production, the labourer did. Now, wh what happens then is that surplus value, which is generated by the worker, uh, becomes capitalized, as Marx says on 715. And, and what we're now beginning to see is, is a process by which labor produces capital. We started off a lot of the argument before as if capital existed and then employed the worker and took on the worker, but we're now going to look at the whole way in which the worker uh, produces, produces capital. And this Lockean kind of argument that erupts on 714.15, or anti-Lockean argument that erupts there, is, I think, a very 
useful starting point to go into what follows. Because it's the unpaid labour which is, of course, going to form the capital down the, down the line. Uh, and then on 7.16, the bottom mark says, Therefore the worker himself constantly produces objective wealth in the form of capital, an alien power that dominates and exploits him. And the capitalist just as constantly produces labour power in the form of a subjective source of wealth, which is abstract, exists merely in the physical body of the worker, and is separated from its own means of objectification and realization. In short, the capitalist produces the worker as a wage labourer. So there's a mutual co-production going on here, where the worker produces the capitalist, and the capitalist produces the worker. On 717 this leads into the formulation that says, actually the worker consumes in two ways. There is productive consumption, i.e. the way the worker consumes materials in the labour process. And then there's individual consumption, which is the way in which the labourer consumes in order to reproduce his or her own life. So when we start to look at that, again, not in terms of individuals, but in terms of the capitalist class and the working class, as Marx proposes at the bottom of 717, we get this company store thing laid out. He says, by converting part of his capital into labour power, the capitalist valorizes the value of his entire capital. So the worker not only produces their own means of production, they also produce the capitalists. And he says, the capitalist kills two birds with one stone. He profits not only by what he receives from the worker, but also what he gives him. The capital given in return for labour power is converted into means of subsistence which have to be consumed to reproduce the muscles, nerves, bones and brains of existing workers, and to bring new workers into existence. Within the limits of what is absolutely necessary, therefore, the individual consumption of the working class is the reconversion of the means of subsistence given by capital in return for labour power into fresh labour power, which capital is then again able to exploit. It is the production and reproduction of the capitalist's most indispensable means of production, the worker. The individual consumption of the worker, whether it occurs inside or outside the workshop, inside or outside the labour process, remains an aspect of the production and reproduction of capital. Just as the cleaning of machinery does, whether it's done during the labour process or when intervals in that process permit. And then Marx makes some comment about the maintenance and reproduction of the working class remains a necessary condition, but the capitalist may safely leave this to the workers' drive for the self-preservation and propagation for self-preservation and propagation. 719, this leads to the thing, to the idea that from the standpoint of society, then, the working class, even when it stands outside the direct labour process, is just as much an appendage of capital as the lifeless instruments of labour are. Now we've come up upon this idea of the labourer as an appendage of capital inside the labour process, within division of labour and also even more spectacularly within machinery, but now we're seeing that labour is actually an appendage of capital outside, in the marketplace in the reproduction process. And he then goes to one of his favourite figures, which is Mr. Potter, not Harry, but the other, whereby, as he puts it, 723, capitalist production therefore reproduces in the course of its own process the separation between labour power and the conditions of labour. It therefore reproduces and perpetuates the conditions under which the worker is exploited. It incessantly forces him to sell his labour power in order to live, and enables the capitalist to purchase labour power in order that he may enrich himself. So, it is no longer an act, a mere accident that capitalist and worker confront each other in the market as buyer and seller. The alternating rhythm of the process, which throws the worker back onto the market again and again as a seller of his labour power. 
In reality, the worker belongs to capital before he has sold himself to the capitalist. His economic bondage is at once mediated through and concealed by the periodic renewal of the act by which he sells himself. So we come to the fundamental conclusion of this chapter. The capitalist process of production, therefore, seen as a total, connected process, i.e. a process of reproduction, produces not only commodities, not only surplus value, but it also produces and reproduces the capital relation itself, on the one hand the capitalist, and on the other the wage labourer. Now it's interesting here, Marx does not look on this reproduction of the capitalist order as primarily a technical problem, or a quantitative flow problem, but as a reproduction of the social relation problem. It's a reproduction of the social relation between capital and labour which is at the heart of the issue. Now, let's look at this diagrammatically for a minute and see what we, what we get. We have the capitalist who begins with money. They begin with money. What do they do? They go into the market and they buy labour power. and they buy means of production. They then bring these two things together in a labour process. the act of production. Out of this labour process there comes a commodity, which is then sold for money plus surplus value or profit. This money then goes back into production, and you just go on and on and on in perpetuity. Now what Marx is doing here is to draw our attention to this dynamic, and then say, look at what labour power does. Labour power goes into the labour process and engages in productive consumption. In return for that, the labour power is given a certain amount of money. And that money then is used to purchase Means of, subsist means of subsistence. So what you then see is that the worker, and we've mentioned this before, is involved in an CMC, circulation process. Commodity, money, commodity, circulation process. And the means of subsistence when they come back into allow the labourer to live. Which allows them to enter back into, some of these commodities flow back. So what Marx is kind of saying is that actually variable capital, and if we look at this circulation process, of labour power in relationship to this, what we're actually seeing is a circulation of variable capital. It's a distinctive form of circulation, and there's a very distinctive reason why Marx calls it 
variable capital, because it is an appendage of capital and a form of capital that circulates through the body of the labourer. Now you can say that's a very inhumane way to look at it, and yes it is, but that's how capital looks at it. As uh, Dickens once put it in one of his novels, he kind of says, you know, it's interesting, what the capitalists do, what the industrialists do is they call their workers hands, because they wish they didn't have brains and stomachs. So this whole terminology, and actually we have a contemporary terminology, for example, firms will talk about human resources, it's not about people, it's human resources, it's about labour supply, it's about all those kinds of things. In fact, we have a whole dehumanised set of words in which we will describe this circulation process, labour inputs, and all the rest of it. So there is a circulation process here, the circulation a circuit of variable capital. And Marx is here arguing, well, initially then, what we've got is a reproduction of the system because the money power that flows in, and this is where the John Locke argument comes in, after a while that money should no longer belong to the capitalist, it should belong to the worker, because they're the ones who engage in all the production, productive consumption and also individual consumption up here. So the labour, labourer is central to this whole process. So that leads him in then chapter 24 to say, well, what happens to the surplus value? If we assume that this goes on to another round of buying labour power and production and all the rest of it, a portion of this combines to come back in, and this time you want labour power the original, but you need more labour power. You need means of production. But you need more means of production. Part of this, however, is taken away as revenue for capitalist consumption. And the big issue we then have to look at is what determines how much of the surplus gets converted into fresh capital to expansion of the system, and how much of it gets converted into revenue and just sort of consumed away, and what is the relationship between reinvestment of part of the surplus, this part is reinvestment, and consumption of revenues. Now, as Marx says, the, the, the employment of surplus value as capital, or its reconversion into capital, is called accumulation of capital. So the accumulation of capital is this process with a part of the surplus value reinvested as capital in the expansion of production. Bottom of 726. Accumulation requires the transformation of a portion of the surplus product into capital. But we cannot, except by a miracle, transform into capital anything but such articles as can be employed in the labour process, i.e. means of production. Consequently, a part of the annual surplus labour must have been applied to the production of additional means of production of subsistence over and above the quantity of these things required to replace the capital advanced. Where are your extra means of production going to come from? Somebody must have produced them somewhere. 
last year if they're going to be available to you this year. That is one of the problems. And if you put into here the whole kind of question that behind all of these means of production, at some point or other, there lies a relation to nature, it would mean simply that you're going to have to expand natural resource extraction. So, you know, somewhere down the line, you're going to have to do a lot of that. Now, then comes 727. Not only the question of where do the means of production come from, but where does the where do the extra workers come from? And Marx says, well, the mechanism of capitalist production has already provided for this in advance by reproducing the working class as a class dependent on wages, a class whose ordinary wages suffice not only to maintain itself, but also to increase its numbers. So what he's looking at here is the idea that population expansion is part and parcel of answering that question as to where does the extra labour come from, but as we're going to see, there are other ways in which that extra labour can be provided. On 728-729, he goes back over the John Lockean myth, this time with a capital of ten thousand pounds and two thousand pounds that comes from the surplus, and says, well, you know, when we take that Lockean argument in, in this society, as he says on top of 729, in every case, he says, the working class creates by the surplus labour of one year the capital destined to employ additional labour in the following year. And this is what is called creating capital out of capital. You call it creating capital out of capital when it's actually the working class that produces it. And he then cites uh, Wakefield, who's going to come up again, in our analysis much later, right at the bottom, in footnote 5, approving and saying, labour creates capital before capital employs labour. Wakefield, at least, got it right. But, towards the bottom of 729, each individual transaction continues to conform to the laws of commodity exchange. There's no cheating going on. With the capitalist always buying labour power and the worker always selling it at what we shall assume is its real value, i.e. the assumption everything trades at its value. It is quite evident from this that the laws of appropriation or of private property, laws based on the production and circulation of commodities, become changed into their direct opposite through their, inter their own internal and inexorable dialectic. The exchange of equivalence, he says, becomes the non-equivalent of surplus value. The relation of exchange between capitalist and worker, he says at the bottom, becomes a mere semblance belonging only to the process of circulation. It becomes a mere form which is alien to the content of the transaction itself, and merely mystifies itself. The constant sale and purchase of labour power is the form, the market form. The content is the constant appropriation by the capitalist without equivalent of a portion of the labour of others which has already been objectified, and his re repeated exchange of this labour for a greater quantity of the living labour of others. Property, bottom of that paragraph, turns out to be the right on the part of the capitalist to appropriate the unpaid labour of others or its product, and the impossibility on the part of the worker of appropriating his own product. The separation of property from labour thus becomes the necessary consequence of a law that apparently originated in their identity. The law that originated in its identity is that of Locke, but the perversion of that into this particular form of law is another matter. There then follows a reprise of Theory of surplus value again, if you want to read that carefully, on 731, 732 you should do so. But you get the surplus theory of surplus value kind of reiterated. 
And he then says, well, again, we've been looking at that theory of surplus value from the standpoint of the individual worker. At the bottom of 732 he says, to be sure the matter looks quite different if we consider capitalist production and the uninterrupted flow of its renewal, and if, in place of the individual capitalist and the individual worker, we view them in their totality as a capitalist class and a working class. But in so doing, we should be applying standards entirely foreign to commodity production. In other words, workers and capitalists do not approach each other in the marketplace as classes. They approach each other in the marketplace as individuals, individual capitalists, individual workers. So you're seeing this class system being perpetuated through the individualism of this. The result is that individual relations of that sort typically hide the class relations. And the class relation depends entirely on this dialectical inversion of the nature of private property rights, from the Lockean view to the capitalistic system. And that has been accomplished, remember, through the way in which circulation on the market and what goes on in the realm of production are separate realms but integrated with each other. So you could produce surplus in production, not in the market. And it's that inversion, he says, on 733 at the bottom, this result, that is the inversion, becomes inevitable from the moment there is a free sale by the worker himself of labour power as a commodity. It is the commodity form of labour power which is the issue. But it's also only from then onwards that commodity production is generalised and becomes a typical form of production. In other words, here's another one of those passages where Marx is kind of saying, it's only when all of this becomes totally generalised that we're going to have this system operating in its perfected way. And then goes on to say, it's also true that only there does it enfold all of its hidden potentialities. To the extent that commodity production, in accordance with its own imminent laws, undergoes a further development into capitalist production, the property laws of commodity production must undergo a dialectical inversion so that they become laws of capitalist appropriation. Section 2 the political economist's erroneous conception of reproduction on an increasing scale. Well, there are many stories that are told about why the system expands. One of them is, the capitalists spend their revenue on consumption and they employ retainers and all that kind of thing, and this is where the expansion is coming from. Marx will have none of that, that has nothing to do with the expansion of the system. The second is the idea that somehow or other capitalists are going to save and hoarding has something to do with it. They're going to take that surplus value and, and, and save it and hoard it. Again, Marx kind of says that's a popular kind of idea but it's nonsense, and most e political economists recognised it as nonsense. On 736, the classical economists are therefore quite right to maintain that the consumption of the surplus product by productive instead of unproductive workers is a characteristic feature of the process of accumulation. That is, you've got to reinvest in this labour process, which is generating the surplus. <coughs> but you've not only got to reinvest in that, and this is where he says, well, not only does this mean advancing more wages, more variable capital, but you also want to have, you're going to have to buy more means of production. So he says, what this means is more labour power has to be, you have to put more money into the purchasing the labour power and more into purchasing extra means of production. You put those two together and that is where accumulation comes from. Now, this imposes all kinds of complicated relations. I've already suggested that one of the issues is if, for example, I rely upon extra energy resources, somebody somewhere must have already produced the extra energy resources in order for them to be available in the market for me to expand smoothly and freely. 
somebody must have produced the extra machinery, or the new machinery, somebody must have… In other words, this is a very complicated time problem here. How does this dynamic actually work? Well, says Marx, it's a complicated issue, and I will look at that in volume two, which he does. And you have to get used to the idea that, yeah, he's going to look at it in volume two, and he's going to have some pretty good ideas about it. Uh, he mentions here that one of those good ideas he's taken from the physiocrats in the Tableau Economique, in which they actually set up what we now would call something like an input-output system, so that there was an equilibrium of flows of people making means of production in relationship to wage goods in relationship, so and Marx takes that over and develops these ideas at length in volume two. But he's going to push ahead and then ask the question, where does this division of surplus value into capital and revenue come from? As he says on 738, one part of the surplus value is consumed by the capitalist as revenue. Let's consume it away. The other part is employed as capital, i.e. it is accumulated. So why does this occur? It is the owner of surplus value, the capitalist, who makes this division. It is an act of his will. The interesting question is, why does a capital capitalist as an active agent decide to do this? Why don't they just consume it all away and have a good time? His answer comes on 739, in a very important passage. Except as capital personified, the capitalist has no historical value and no right to that historical existence which, to use Lishnowski's amusing expression, ain't got no date. It is only to this extent that the necessity of the capitalist's own transitory existence is implied in the transitory necessity of the capitalist mode of production. But insofar as he is capital personified, his motivating force is not the acquisition and enjoyment of use values, but the acquisition and augmenta augmentation of exchange values. He is fanatically intent on the valorization of value. Consequently, he ruthlessly forces the human race to produce for production's sake. In this way, he spurs on the development of society's productive forces, and the creation of those material conditions of production which alone can form the real basis of a higher form of society, society in which the full and free development of every individual forms a ruling principle. Again, notice there's a positive potentiality in all of this. Only as a personification of capital is the capitalist respectable. As such, he shares with the miser an absolute drive towards self-enrichment. Go back to the passage about what separates the miser from the capitalist. But what appears in the miner as the mania of an individual is in the capitalist the effect of a social mechanism in which he is merely a cog. Moreover, the development of capitalist production makes it necessary constantly to increase the amount of capital laid out in a given industrial undertaking, and competition subordinates every individual capitalist to the imminent laws of capitalist production as external and coercive laws. It compels him to keep extending his capital so as to preserve it, and he can only extend it by means of progressive accumulation. Number of issues here. We've seen that money is a form of social power which is appropriatable by private persons. So there's an incentive for those in search of social power to expand this system, to gain more and more of it, as there is the incentive of the miser, of self-enrichment. There are lots of reasons why people want to accumulate that social power. But the point is that anybody who is a capitalist is also impelled by the coercive laws of competition by other capitalists to reinvest a part of their surplus whether they like it or not. They don't have a choice. If I don't reinvest, you will. And if you reinvest and I have not, eventually I'm no longer be a capitalist. You're going to drive me out of business, particularly if you reinvest in new machinery, new activities. So what Marx is saying here is that you have to see the capitalist as actually being embedded within the social relations of a capitalist system, and 
no matter whether they're good people or bad people or greedy people or nice people or power-hungry people or decent people, that all of them at some point or other are faced with this choice, reinvest part of your surplus and stay in business, or consume it away and cease to be a capitalist. Simple as that. So Marx is kind of saying that this is the centerpiece of what a capitalist system is about. But the capitalists, faced with that reality, try to make a virtue out of what is actually a social necessity. So on page 740 we find him introducing the capitalist argument about abstinence. They're abstaining from consumption. You know, they're trying to do good for society by abstaining from consumption. They're refraining from consumption. And oh, what good people they are! The fact that they have no choice in the matter is hidden behind the idea that they're engaging in abstinence in order to reinvest and to build a different kind of society. Well, Marx mocks that process and kind of treats it as this kind of Faustian dilemma, as he puts it on 741. Two souls, alas, do dwell within his breast, one is ever parting from the other, the desire for enjoyment and the necessity of reinvestment for accumulation. And he then talks about how, about Dr. Aiken and his different stages, when he kind of says, well, in the initial stages, capital could not afford, capitalists could not afford too much consumption of revenue, because the system was small, it was developing and all this kind of stuff, and then as time went on they got more and more surplus, they could consume more and more of it, and then you get to the fourth stage where they can start to be really be conspicuous consumers. I mean, it'd be very hard in today's world to argue that somehow the capitalists are really engaging in abstinence. But back then there was a tendency to do this, so the point that Marx is making is, uh, forget that abstinence argument, the only reason, that if, if you see something like abstinence is only because capitalists don't have any option uh, except uh, to do that. Vulgar economics supported this notion of abstinence. So he goes on to sort of mock that and saying we can't really take this seriously and ends this section on 748 kind of saying, here production and reproduction on an increasing scale go on their way without any intervention from that peculiar saint, that knight of the woeful council, countenance the abstaining capitalist. So we don't need the figure of the abstaining capitalist uh, to, to look at this look at this system. Now, what this implies is this. Back on 742, he's laid out, I think, an extremely important idea. That capital and capitalism by definition is about accumulation. It cannot be about anything else. As he says on the middle of 742, accumulate, accumulate. That is Moses and the prophets. Industry furnishes the material which saving accumulates. Therefore save, save, i.e. reconvert the greatest possible portion of surplus value or surplus product into capital. Accumulation for the sake of accumulation. Production for the sake of production. This was the formula in which classical economics expressed the historical mission of the bourgeoisie in the period of its domination. Not for one instant did it deceive itself over the nature of wealth's birth pangs, but what use is it to lament a historical necessity? If in the eyes of classical economics the proletarian is merely a machine for the production of surplus value, the capitalist too is merely a machine for the transformation of the surplus value into surplus capital. In other words, the theory that Marx is working here you know, I've argued that this book is very much about what is socially necessary. And what is socially necessary to the survival of capitalism is accumulation, for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake. And Marx says even the bourgeois economists understood that. 
Bourgeois political economy understood that. Which means, of course, the system has to grow. So what do we do? We start to think that growth is good. We start to say non-growth is a crisis. I mean, you go to the newspapers, you go to the financial press or anything like that, oh my god, what was the growth rate last year? Oh my god, the growth rate's going down, we've got to get it up again. But why do we have to grow? Marx is saying here, it's a structural necessity within the nature of a capitalist economic system, accumulation for accumulation's sake, production for production's sake, no matter what the social, political and ecological consequences may be. We are locked in. And in exactly the same way that capitalists back then use the abstinence theory to try to transform a social necessity into a virtue. We have done the same thing by simply thinking that growth is good. Lack of growth is a failure. If you can't grow, it's no good. Now. There's a little quirk in here which is kind of interesting, because Marx mentioned on 743 the ideas of Malthus. See, Malthus had a very peculiar way of understanding the world. In his theory of population he explained the poverty of the masses as being due to the fact that they reproduce too fast in relationship to the availability of natural resources food supply in particular. So that therefore poverty, starvation and all the rest of it was inevitable. But in his political economy he was studying the question of, well, where does the effective demand come from? When you sell this at the end of the day for more money, who's got the more money in their pocket? This is another issue. Capitalists collectively start out with this amount of money and end up with more of it at the end of the day, which means somebody somewhere out there has to have more of it in order to buy what the capitalists have produced. This too is a real serious problem about the market. Malthus's solution was, well, the capitalists can't consume it, can't provide the market because they're reinvesting and saving. Workers can't because Malthus didn't say they're being exploited, but obviously the wages, wages can't do it. So there has to be a third class. And the third class are a bunch of consumers who do nothing except consume. And uh, it was landlords, it was priests, it was uh, you know, a whole bunch of consumer classes which were doing a favour to capitalism by consuming as much as they possibly could. And if they didn't consume as much as they possibly could, then the whole, could, the whole system would come crashing down. So Malthus was kind of saying, that's, that's stabilising the system. So at one end of the scale you have the poor who are dying like flies because they're reproducing too much in relationship to natural resources. At the other end of the scale you have consuming classes whose sole job to keep capitalism going is to consume to the hilt. Now this is, as Marx mentions, this is a slightly paradoxical kind of situation. And as he says at the bottom of the page, well actually when, this, you, know, when you had things like the July Revolution and you had Robert Owen and you had the Socialists and, the, and, and, and Owenism and the Fourierists and all the rest of it starting to, and the Socialists beginning to get hold of all of this, people dropped the Malthus kind of argument. But one of the ways in which they dropped the Malthus argument was to do away with the whole effective demand problem. And as I mentioned when we were discussing Say's Law, you remember the distinction between the general glut theorists, people like Malthus who said there could be a crisis of 
overproduction, a general crisis of overproduction. And those who held to Say's law, like Ricardo, who says there can be no such thing because every, every purchase is a sale, and therefore there's equilibrium in the system always. So they got away from, if you like, the political consequences of Malthus's very uncomfortable argument by abandoning the question. Could there be a crisis in the system due to lack of effective demand? Which of course is where Keynes came in and said, yes you could in the 1930s, and we get a completely different setup. Now in section 4, starts 747, again, notice what Marx is doing here. He's suggesting, well, this isn't the only way in which you can get surplus value. There are actually a whole bunch of different strategies the capitalists can use. And notice the flexibility he's talking about. First possibility for getting extra surplus value. Reduce wages below value. More surplus value. There is, however, one problem with that, that if you take that too far, as he says on 748, if labour could be had without purchase, wages might be dispensed with, but if workers could live on air, it would not be possible to buy them at any price. The zero cost of labour is therefore a limit in a mathematical sense, always beyond reach, although we can always approximate more and more nearly to it. The constant tendency of capital is to force the cost of labour back towards this absolute zero. Now the reasons why that, again, remember the contingency argument here, if you've got an effective demand problem it may not be wise to do that. But if that's not a problem, then that's the direction you would move in. <coughs> The other way is that you would actually get the workers themselves to economize. And he talks about cookery books with recipes of all kinds for replacing expensive food with various surrogates. This is no joke actually, this is what uh, Ford did when he set up the sort of five dollar eight hour day. Uh, hired a bunch of social workers to go in and instruct the workers on how exactly how to consume. And uh, actually a lot of bourgeois philanthropy back in the 19th century was precisely about doing exactly this, which is uh, learning to do, and we still find it going on today, right? Learn to do better with the money you've got. There are other ways in which you can go about things. On 751 he talks about saving on constant capital. More efficient uses of constant capital or different forms of constant capital. 751 at the bottom, well you can get something out of nature, free of charge. So if you can substitute something which is natural and, and, and therefore not a commodity, you get something. And he says uh, on 752, it is again, once again the direct action of man on nature which becomes an immediate source of greater accumulation without the intervention of any new capital. And he concludes this, we arrive therefore at this general result. By incorporating with itself the two primary creators of wealth, labour power and land, capital acquires a power of expansion that permits it to augment the elements of its accumulation beyond the limits apparently fixed by its own magnitude, or by the value and the mass of the means of production which have already been produced and which it has its being. Then he gets into transformations in productivity, which are again very important, scale, and so on. Uh, he also gets into the way in which old machines, which have been amortized, can be used in this process. On 754 he talks about science and technology and improved methods. He says, every time improved methods are introduced, therefore, this has an almost simultaneous impact on the new capital and the capital already engaged in its function. 
Every advance in chemistry not only multiplies the number of useful materials and the useful applications of those already known, thus extending capital's sphere of investment along with its growth, it also teaches capital how to throw back the waste, this is recycling, from the processes of production and consumption into the cycle of the process of reproduction, and thus without any previous outlay of capital it creates fresh materials for it. Science and technology goes on to say, give capital a power of expansion which is independent of the given magnitude of the capital actually functioning. Notice how those elements that we were talking about, those moments we were talking about at the beginning of the chapter on machinery, when we were talking about technology and nature, uh, mental conceptions, social relations, all those things are actually being employed here. These are, you know, in a way, by going around all of those elements, you can find ways to actually improve on this and improve on that and actually get extra surplus value out of it. And then 756, 757, or 757 in particular, he starts to talk about past labour, which gets disguised as capital. Elements, he says, that are only partly consumed to the degree that they do perform, as you saw earlier, the same free service as the forces of nature, such as water, steam, air and electricity. There's often a problem of capitalist production of dual products, joint products. You have cattle and you have, therefore you have hides and you have meat, and you have milk, joint products. So. Maybe you're, you're going after them because of their meat, so you suddenly find there are all these hides lying around and they're essentially a free good, because you're really producing the cattle for the meat and so the hides are there, so the leather goods can take off with the hides, so again it's, it's free good. So, so Marx is here talking about all the ways in which capitalists can utilize all of these ways to augment the accumulation process. And so in section 5 on 758, he comes to something which again I think you really do have to emphasize in his treatment of capital. He says, it has been shown in the course of this inquiry, and I invite you to go back and think about where he has shown it, that capital is not a fixed magnitude, but a part of social wealth which is elastic and constantly fluctuates with the division of surplus value into revenue and additional capital. It has been seen further that even with a given magnitude of functioning capital, the labour power, science and land, which means economically speaking all the objects of labour furnished by nature without human intervention, incorporated in it form elastic powers of capital, allowing it within certain limits a field of action independent of its own magnitude. In this inquiry we have ignored all relations arising from the process of circulation, remember the assumption, which may produce very different degrees of efficiency in the same mass of capital. Then he goes on to say, classical political economy has always liked to conceive social capital as a fixed magnitude of a fixed degree of efficiency, but this Prejudice was first established as a dogma by the arch-Philistine Jeremy Bentham, that soberly pedantic and heavy-footed oracle of the common sense of the nineteenth-century bourgeoisie. Well, okay. But, but it, I always find it so fascinating. The people who are around who conceive the world in a very fixed form are often let off the hook, and Marx has always been accused of fixing things, when actually He's giving you one of the most fluid possible ways of thinking about how this damn system works. And you better watch out for how this works. I mean, you won't understand how it works and you think, well, you can put the bung in here and stop it dead, but it'll go off over there. Tremendous flexibility in the system. And Marx is very, very concerned, I think, to try to really sort of both emphasize its fluidity and its flexibility. And, and, to, and, and to identify all of those forms of flexibility and so on, so that we get a better understanding of how this system works. This system would have come to a stop years ago, if it had been as so fixed as many of the classical political economists suppose it to be. And it is its very dynamism, in all senses, which becomes absolutely critical. And so he ends on that, on that note, that the accumulation of capital is 
a highly flexible process. But, of course, it's always still got its possible blockages. And interestingly, right at the end of this, on 761, he says, the greater part of the yearly accruing surplus product which is embezzled from the English workers without any equivalent being given in return, is thus used as capital, not in England but in foreign countries, but with the additional capital thus exported a part of the labour fund invented by God and Bentham naturally also flows out of the country. Now, we've excluded by assumption foreign trade, but it's interesting that he brings this back in here as one of the other ways in which the system is able to adjust and be flexible. He's not going to deal with it very much here, only later in, in the book will he come back to this, but again those assumptions work. So the accumulation of capital then works in this kind of, this kind of way. And when we start to look at it, we see a certain dynamism, and then we can see all kinds of contingent things around it that allow this system new means of production. Maybe they're free goods from nature, maybe they're hides which are not being used, maybe they're old machines that have been amortized and therefore are free goods, maybe they're urban infrastructures that have been amortized and are free goods all of those sorts of things. Science and technology allows you to recycle, so some of the waste that you get in production can be then go into being means of production in the next cycle. So you've got all kinds of cycles which are possible here. And, like I've been emphasizing, you have to see the flexibility and fluidity very much in the system. So, we're out of time here. Next week I want to do the general law of capitalist accumulation. Chapter 25, and we're going to spend a lot of time on the first four sections. Section 5 is a very, very long empirical thing, like the working day and some of the stuff on the factory acts and machinery and so on. Very rich, and if you're interested in how Marx is viewing the Irish and, and their role in, in all of this, this is, this is uh, useful. And, and, and important, and you see how the reserve army is, is created and so on. But the heart of the argument is in the first four sections, which is rather a dense theoretical argument in which Marx brings together many of the elements he's just put in place in these two chapters, as well as many of the elements which were there earlier, and you'll see him putting it together in a dynamic model of the accumulation of capital under the assumptions which he's laid out in the beginning of this part 7. Always remember that. But it's a very important thing that you really grapple very hard with these first four sections of chapter 25, and see if you can get them straight uh, on your own, because it's a, it's, a, it's a very powerful and important culmination to the theoretical argument in Volume 1 of Capital. Okay, so we'll do that next time.